Welcome to today's webinar. Before we get started today, I would like to make a few brief announcements. We know many of you are listening in from far away and can't attend local events or programs. That's why we provide this free webinar series. We host multiple webinars per month, so please visit our website to view the current schedule for 2018. Simply visit our website at www.johnson-center.org and click on the webinars link on the right hand side. New webinars and events are often added, so if you are not on our email list, I encourage you to visit our website and click on the Join Our Email List link that appears on the home page. To get instant news and events from the Johnson Center, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as we often announce grant and scholarship opportunities, research opportunities, and special events and presentations there. And be sure to check out our YouTube channel at youtube.com forward slash the Johnson Center. There you'll find a library of several of our past presentations. We have many exciting programs still to come this year, including some fun fall and holiday events. On September 22nd, we hope those of you nearby can join us for our next Teddy Bear Clinic, a fun family event coordinated by our child life team. We also have recently announced a new program providing sliding fee scale counseling services with additional grants for those in need. And our diagnostic clinic now has a number of grants and supports available in order to ensure that families have faster access to assessment services by our staff psychologist. Follow our Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram pages to check in our to check in to our website blog for more information. Be sure to follow our colleagues at the Autism Research Institute as they host their own webinar initiative, and they share some great resources on our website and social media pages. If you would like a certificate of attendance after today's webinar, look for a follow-up email in your mailbox one hour after the webinar concludes, or look for the link on our YouTube channel in the webinar description. It will contain instructions on how to get your certificate. If you have questions during the live webinar, please type them into your GoToWebinar control panel or email info at johnson-center.org. If you are watching a recording of this webinar, you may email questions to the presenter at info at johnson-center.org. Today's webinar is a Q&A with Kelly Barnhill. Kelly is the director of the Nutrition Clinic at the Johnson Center for Child Health and Development. She is a certified clinical nutritionist with over 15 years of experience working with nutrition in children with autism and related disorders. At the Johnson Center, she directs a team of dietitians and nutritionists that have served over 3,000 children through this practice. In addition to her clinical practice, Kelly also serves the Johnson Center care across the practice within the organization. In 2008, Kelly accepted the position of nutrition coordinator for the Autism Research Institute. In this role, she designs and manages curriculum and training for hundreds of nutrition practitioners each year, as well as providing direct, direct training for thousands of parents. Kelly is a sought-after presenter, speaking at several national and international conferences each year. Her studies and work at Johnson Center for Child Health and Development are the culmination of many years' effort and expertise, with the last several years devoted to understanding the biological underpinnings of the disorder we know as autism. Her work has raised awareness of the need for these services for children with autism and related disorders. Please welcome Kelly Moore. Hello, thanks for joining us. Um, I uh, am happy to be here to talk with you today about um, nutrition and autism, and I am amazed at the number of questions that we've gotten already. Um, so I've tried to group the ones that we've received to date um, so that I can share some similarly themed answers uh, with you. Um, but I think we'll be bouncing around a bit, so please bear with me. Um, the first questions I have are regarding the specific carbohydrate diet. Uh, which websites do you recommend for SCD recipes? This is a tough one for me because I bounce around a lot and I follow and uh, I follow blogs and websites and also social media because several of these people post recipes on Instagram um, to pull things that I know are SCD legal or can be altered to for that purpose. So my go to's really in looking for SCD legal or um, recipes that can be made SCD legal are of course, pecanbread.com, which is a great place to start and has been around forever and has great resources and tips. I like Paleo Mama, which has a great recipe um, section, as well as Wellness Mama. And Wellness Mama has just recently published a cookbook that uh, looks very interesting and largely SCD compliant as well. 
Uh, there's Whole30 recipes, and many of those recipes can be made to be SCD compliant. I like Against All Grain, and I'll also follow Deliciously Ella. Uh, I really also like um, Allie Segerstern's Nourishing Meals website and her Instagram account because she posts beautiful meals that she shares with her children regularly, and many of those are appropriate for those following an SCD diet. So I hope that's helpful. If you have follow-up questions about those, um, just type them in and I'll get to them in a bit. Another SCD question that I received was, how do I know if a supplement is SCD legal? Well, number one for me, I if you're beginning an intervention like SCD, I strongly recommend that you work with a knowledgeable practitioner because that individual will help you safely begin an SCD and also help you troubleshoot and problem solve the issue of supplements because many of them appear to be SCD legal and there are a variety of reasons why they really don't fit an SCD plan. Um, if you are on an SCD and you want to verify that your supplements are SCD legal, you can go to the Pecan Bread website and there are many lists there that will help you understand legal and illegal additives and also some brands of supplements that are appropriate. Another question that kind of fits in this realm that, I, realm that I've received is, is a paleo diet healthy for my child? And paleo diets are very similar to SCD. Um, again, from a practitioner's perspective, I, I navigate and um, evaluate all paleo um, recipes and can make them compliant with SCD if needed. Uh, but for, for for the most part, paleo is very similar to what we would be doing with SCD or GAPS. Uh, and to answer the question about whether it's healthy for your child, yes, as long as you are working with someone um, or you've evaluated, okay, what nu nutrients are you taking away on this diet and what do you need to replace? What kind of supplements would be appropriate? Um, how do you get fiber in? As long as you can answer all of those questions and you do it in a thoughtful way, way, looking at the nutritional components that might be compromised by moving to paleo, it can absolutely be a healthy approach for a child. Another question I received is, what can you tell us about the keto diet? Um, so everyone's talking about ketogenic diets right now, and um, I can tell you lots about keto diets and whether or not they're appropriate for an individual child. I can't tell you. There are so many factors in play, um, and it, it's troublesome to me that this has become such a popular intervention um, because it's not as simple as picking up a, um, a book or going to a website and putting your child on a keto diet. It shouldn't be that way at all because there are so many underlying health concerns for many of the children that we serve that we have to take into account when we talk about making the significant changes in uh, dietary content that one does with a ketogenic diet. I have managed several children on ketogenic diets who've done really, really well, and a few who have come in on ketogenic diets that we've had to bolster and problem solve because there are pretty significant issues going on. Um, many kids can tolerate a keto approach just fine, and it's a healthy and safe way to, but it is a medically prescribed diet, and it's built on a medically prescribed diet that's been around for almost 100 years. Having said that, I feel like a practitioner who knows it well needs to be in it from the beginning, because we're not necessarily talking about a classical ketogenic approach in which an individual was formerly, it, the way that keto uh, diets were started in the past and are now for very um, medically involved or medically fragile individuals is in a hospitalized setting um, with lots of data taken before, during, and after that process so that it can be managed well. And um, I would just caution you, if you're thinking about beginning a ketogenic diet, find a quality nutritionist who's used that intervention with other children and other children specifically with autism who understands the nuances of making it uh, appropriate and safe for your child. Uh, another question we received, if I take milk products away from my child, how do I get things like vitamin A and vitamin D and fat into him? My pediatrician says that my child needs milk. 
uh, I think that's a great question. Um, number one, vitamin A and D, we can get through many other sources. And the most common one that we use and that I recommend for families is cod liver oil because we're getting high quality um, essential fatty acids and also vitamin A and vitamin D meet your child's needs. Uh, in terms of fat, resources available, including healthy fats in the diet that milk um, sources don't need to be the only uh, way that we're exposed to a fat. Uh, things like coconut milk, um, coconut yogurt is another great option. Uh, we have tons of safe, healthy oils that we can use now, like avocado, um, olive oil, things like that we can use. We can work in some coconut oil or palm oil for saturated fats as well. Um, so don't be afraid uh, that you don't feel like you're creating um, an un, um, you're creating a situation that you can't fix by removing fluid milk or all milk products from your child because it's very easy to find ways to get that nutrition in through other avenues. Uh, let's see, what else do we have here? Do you believe in food sensitivity blood tests? Um, food sensitivity testing is an issue that um, we deal with frequently and that is not necessarily controversial, but uh, it's questioned by many in the community. And we do employ food sensitivity testing in some circumstances. Um, sometimes uh, there are certain labs that we use that um, we rely upon to do, uh, because we believe in their quality. We've looked at um, split sample testing, and we feel like they can be part of the roadmap to help us make decisions. So, for example, um, if we have a child who has been on an elimination diet of some kind but is still responsive to foods, and is um, responsive to, and we can't pinpoint what it might be, um, we might ask for a food sensitivity or an IgG panel or an, um, uh, something similar to be able to say, evaluate what we might see in terms of food responsiveness for that child. What that tells me um, often when we get a result back, so if we run an 80 or 150 antigen panel and it comes back and there are many, many responses, that tells me that's more of an immune system, overall immune system response that we need to dampen down. It doesn't necessarily mean that that child is responsive to all those foods. It means to me that something's going on, that this child is responding to lots and lots of things. And then we shift intervention and focus on calming down and restoring balance for the GI tract and the immune system so that um, the child is less responsive to many things in the long term. I'll also have um, situations in which families come in and a parent wants to start an elimination diet and another and the other parent um, refuses to do so without data. And in those situations, I counsel th through the possibility of false positives and false negatives and um, how we use this data uh, um, in terms of making a plan moving forward. And sometimes parents are adamant, like I wanna draw this test anyway before we remove casein protein or gluten or soy from my child's diet. And then we will order from labs that we trust um, for a full evaluation for that child and interpret appropriately when it um, uh, returns. Another question that we've gotten is, my four-year-old has constipation and is a picky eater. I would like to find an appropriate fiber supplement for him. What should I look for? So my uh, thoughts on constipation are, make sure you're getting enough fluid in first. Um, absolutely, for a four-year-old, you wanna try and target, depending on weight, but really aim for one ounce of preferably plain water uh, per pound of body weight. Um, on a daily basis across the day. And that's the number one thing that we like to check off when we're dealing with constipation. Um, the second thing in looking at adding fiber into the diet, 
um, if the child is a selective eater and simply will not consume foods that contain like great fiber like fruits and vegetables, then adding a supplement in is appropriate. And the ones that we use and like, there's one of my um, vital nutrients that's really good. Uh, their fiber product is really good. It dissolves easily. We also use one by Designs for Health called Paleo Fiber, which is dairy free, um, but it's a powder that's also flavored and has um, some other components as well that kids seem to tolerate well, particularly blended in a thicker drink like a milk product, um, a nut milk or uh, coconut milk. Um, and I would start low and slow with that because you could either exacerbate uh, the constipation um, or if you start at full dose and your child is a quick responder, you could create a situation that would be aversive for your child if you created, create diarrhea in that process. So, um, and the last thing that I would add is really think about magnesium content um, and adding magnesium probably in a citrate form um, to uh, increase bowel motility as well. And so if you look at those three things kind of in tandem, that should help uh, address ongoing constipation issues, particularly in picky eaters. I'm an RD and I have been researching diets. What would you recommend for a four-year-old male? I've put him on a gluten and casein-free diet for the past two years, but I'm willing to research other suggestions. Thanks for your question. I, I feel like I probably need some additional data before um, answering that, but the things that I would think about from a clinical perspective are, um, number one, how did he respond to gluten and casein-free intervention when it began? Um, was there a significant behavioral response? Was there a significant sleep response? Was there a significant GI response? And then I would look at what his uh, GI tract looks like now. So does he have ongoing constipation or diarrhea? Um, does he have specific GI targets that you're trying to address with further um, dietary change? Um, and the last thing I guess I would say is, for me, I would really look at the quality of what you're putting into that gluten and casein-free diet, as well as just removing those proteins. So uh, I'm sure that you're thinking about all of that, but I would really work on bringing in fermented foods, for example. Um, working with whole diets, so looking at a paleo or whole 30 or other approach that really includes lots of great healthy vegetables, lean proteins, fats, etc. Um, and if you have specific targets, either email us again or type in um, further information and I'm happy to respond privately after the webinar because um, if you have other data that would help drive that, I can give you specific information on other elimination diet thoughts that we might have. Another question we have here is, I have a child with high functioning autism and fragile X syndrome. He gets diarrhea and usually has loose stools, because, and because of this, it's getting difficult for him to be potty trained as he doesn't feel the urgency to use the bathroom. He doesn't drink milk, but he does like to eat cheese and yogurt. He eats lots of different foods, including vegetarian and non-vegetarian. He likes chewy things. He does have some behavior issues. My question is, how are all these issues related to diet, and by following what kind of diet can these issues be managed and resolved? I think that um, the beginning place for a child who has ongoing diarrhea is looking at what uh, might be triggering it and ruling out other things like an infectious cause, um, a lack of good flora in the gut, um, things like that, uh, a, a food response, uh, responsiveness that uh, can be problematic. So for me, I would really begin by looking at the data and what you have. Um, for example, if the child has a history of lots of antibiotic use, you might want to think about bringing in probiotics first and see what effect that might have on the stool. Then you might want to um, think about working with a practitioner who could help you order some basic uh, stool tests to see if there is a parasite or um, a bacterial infection that could easily be resolved. And then once those things are addressed, then I would think about 
um, if he, as it sounds like he eats lots of different types of foods, it, I think you could safely begin to look at and learn about an elimination diet, removing the common offenders first, which um, in our experience tend to be milk protein might be causing that diarrhea that you mentioned, or um, gluten or soy would be the three top proteins that I would say just think about starting there and absolutely seek further guidance in doing that because it's it's a tricky process as I mentioned earlier and you don't want to do that without some guidance I think. I have been giving my son who has autism inositol powder to combat OCD. Um, and there's some information here. The, this is an adult um, who has autism, and um, he's been receiving um, inositol powder for the past two years. Um, and the question is, can you comment on recommended dosage benefits and any known side effects? And my experience with inositol is that it can be very effective in modulating OCD, um, panic behaviors, um, anxiety, uh, depression, and there's research out there that's been published to support each of those. Um, because I don't know which product you're using, um, I can't tell you based on the information you've given me here about an eighth of a teaspoon and a, and a quarter of a teaspoon, I can't tell you what my dose in terms of teaspoons would be, but I would say that you can safely give an adult with, with no known side effects to my knowledge. Um, given that I don't have information on other things that he's taking, which medication wise, um, I would encourage you to look at um, interaction there. But um, I would say that you can safely begin at a dose of three grams daily. Um, and I would do that in a divided dose across the day with three grams. But the research in various areas, so depression, bipolar, um, panic attacks, uh, anxiety, the research that's been published goes up much higher than that in terms of dose. So you can safely start at three grams um, and see if that makes a difference in the issue that you're uh, attempting to modulate with it. If your child simply won't eat healthy foods, what top supplements do you recommend? Um, I think that's a great question because I think we all have times in our lives when we just won't eat healthy foods. Um, we go through periods of time where um, our diets can always be improved. And for me, um, I like to start with a whole food supplement of some kind. And again, I've mentioned a few of those brands. Designs for Health uh, is one that we use. Um, there are also uh, a number the paleo paleo reds and paleo greens. Meta, uh, Metagenics makes a good product, um, and Thorn has a good product. And I would just start with a whole food based supplement because there are so many things there in that that we don't know about because we don't know the synergistic factors that necessarily assist and support the vitamins that we uh, take synthetically. Um, so I like to cover all those bases so we get all that great nutrition in. Um, and then I also add uh, a good quality, either basic, you know, RDA, 100% RDA quality um, multivitamin and mineral product or a therapeutic multivitamin and mineral product for the kids that I see with autism who um, have noted deficiencies in areas that uh, might be benefited by extra B6 or B12, for example. And those products, I, I really like Claire Labs. They're a, a solid um, manufacturer that I trust and I've worked with for, gosh, almost 20 years. Um, I really like Kirkman Labs. They have some great quality multivitamin and mineral products. Uh, Thorn Nutrients makes really good quality um, comprehensive products that are safe for kids. Um, and I like Integrative Therapeutics. They make, they did make products specifically for teens that were really great. I don't think they, I think they've discontinued that one at this time, but they have other multivitamin products that are still appropriate for pediatrics and adults. Um, and I would start there. And then of course I would 
always for all of us, I recommend fish oil. I recommend or an EPA DHA support product of your choice to get your essential fatty acids in each day. Um, and then other recommendations beyond that, I think, are, are specific to the child. So if the child isn't eating any healthy foods, do you have a constipation issue? And that's when you start talking about the fiber supplement that I mentioned earlier to support that and the magnesium to support that. So another question we have here is, my seven-year-old daughter has been gluten and casein free for many years. I find that her stools are very light and don't seem healthy. What do you suggest next? She's a picky eater as well. Her stool is light and more yellow as opposed to solid and brown. So I would strongly recommend that you work with a practitioner and get someone to um, evaluate what that mean, that might be. Because uh, sitting here, it, it, there are a few things that a light yellowish stool could mean from a practitioner's perspective. Um, and running a simple stool analysis could give you some answers on what to do next. And it might not be a dietary issue. It might be a a need for additional pancreatic enzymes. It might be a need for, um, there, there could be um, elevated fecal fat that needs to be addressed. You need to decide why there might be elevated fecal fat, what's driving that, and how do you treat it. And those are tests that you can absolutely start with your pediatrician and say, hey, I feel I'm, I'm concerned that this is going on. Um, and could we just order a simple stool analysis? If you have a relationship with um, a functional medicine provider or a functional nutritionist who can order those labs for you, those are more broad spectrum, um, and that those panels would also tell you um, what are your levels of pancreatic enzymes, how, um, what are the chances that there's some inflammation going on, and are, are there any elevated uh, inflammatory markers like calprotectin, what is your secretory IgA like, all of those variables might uh, need to be addressed, and that's what I would actually be thinking about um, in this situation, as opposed to changing her diet. Um, and if you have additional information like that, that you want to follow up on this question with me, uh, just send it along via email or type it into the um, control panel, and I'll make sure that I follow up with you privately. Let's see what else we have here. Um, I think we've covered that. I have an interesting question here. Is there any reason for a child to eat the rind of a citric fruit? Um, and what's interesting, and I think um, might be the, the purpose here, um, it, it, there are um, a number of benefits really to citrus rind, specifically lemon. There's a little bit of information out there online, but just in terms of GI health and integrity. Um, but there are other ways to do that for kids too, um, so that you're promoting GI health integrity and also detoxification. So it's not necessarily an issue. It's not a bad thing. Um, but it's, uh, and it, it's beneficial, but if you have a child who, um, you know, is, is interested in lemon peels, I would not be worried about that. So in reading the question, I'm not quite sure, um, which way to go with that because it, yes, it's a supplement, um, that, uh, a dietary approach that can be beneficial and healthy for the GI tract. If the child is craving this, that might warrant further investigation. So I'm not sure if I was able to answer your question or not, but I hope I did. Um, we have a question here. Uh, if you had a young adult with autism in your practice who had a history of vomiting several times a day, what protocol would you follow? Uh, the information, additional information that's provided is he has been taking the same three medications for reflux for several years. Medical testing indicates nothing physical. Uh, if at home, this individual will suddenly go into the bathroom and vomit and comes out as if nothing has happened. And prior to the episode, there is no behavior at all. In the community, he may just stop and vomit. The individual is not a picky eater, and our behavior analyst believes it is a behavior. So I have many more questions than answers on this one, but the questions that pop into my head are what type of medical testing ruled out any medical issue? I just want to confirm that there was a... Uh, a full gastrointestinal uh, workup to include 
colonoscopy and endoscopy, uh, maybe a barium uh, swallow, uh, just to rule out uh, any possible medical contribution um, from a GI perspective to this behavior. Um, then I would say, has anyone thought about or discussed, and I can't tell from the information that's been provided, if anyone's talked about cyclical vomiting syndrome um, on this? Um, I tend to, when uh, I look at a medical, what appears to be a response to a medical situation, I tend to believe that there is a physiological uh, reason for this to be occurring and that we need to figure out what's causing it. Um, I, I wonder about the medications that he's on and um, if there could be some interaction there, if by using so much medication, we've created a response to um, stomach acid production that might be problematic. Um, and in suppressing that acid, uh, we've uh, created something that um, doesn't allow digestion long term. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I don't think I'm um, able to give you more information than that. But if you email me, I'll I'll try to help you um, by answering further questions. What fish oil brand would you recommend for a four-year-old boy with ASD? And what is better, fish oil or cod liver oil? So we used a number of different brands here. Um, the, the tricky part with fish oil is that until a child can swallow very large pills, you have to find a way to get um, what can be a not so pleasant smelling uh, liquid into a younger child. Um, we like Nordic Naturals products. We've used them for a very long time and trust their um, screening process and their integrity. Um, I think that the product that we use for kids in this um, age range is called either Ultimate Omega if it's bought retail um, at a store like Whole Foods at, or a local pharmacy, and it's called Pro Omega if it's purchased from a practitioner. Um, that product, uh, you can easily get to the dose that you need for a child that age, which for us, I aim for about two and a half to three grams each day um, with one or two capsules, depending on which you purchase, or with the liquid, um, with about a teaspoon of the liquid. Um, those are the fish oil products that we use. I also like to use cod liver oil, like I mentioned earlier, because I believe it's a healthy source of vitamin A and vitamin D. Um, and those are fat soluble vitamins that are right there with uh, fats to be uh, absorbed. Um, so I think that's important. The, the downside is I typically use both products. So, and the reason for that is fish oil that's derived from the fish body does not contain vitamin A and D. Um, and cod, the liver oil contains higher le high levels of vitamin A and vitamin D, but to get the levels of e uh, essential fatty acids that we aim for and the research tells us we should use, um, you would get toxicity quite quickly with using cod liver oil alone because cod liver oil provides high levels of these fat soluble vitamins that are stored in the body um, and you could reach uh, upper limits quickly. So we use fish body oils. So uh, that ultimate omega or pro omega that I mentioned earlier, um, we use that for uh, essential fatty acid support, EPA, DHA, and we use cod liver oil for a little bit of essential fatty acid support, but primarily for vitamins A and D. In addition to Nordic Naturals, there are lots of other brands that we use too. We like Vital Nutrients. I really like Soroyal, which is a British company. Um, I think that you can find great products through Metagenics. Uh, Pure Encapsulations makes a really nice product that um, is encapsulated, but they also have a liquid that is very similar to Nordic Naturals. Um, so any of those, I think, uh, I, I, we use and recommend here regularly.
My son is 18. For three years, at the advice of our pediatrician, we've been simplifying his diet towards meat and vegetables in an effort to find what is causing allergic reactions in his body. First went wheat and dairy, which almost immediately ended his eczema. What has been elusive though are blue bands below his eyes. They are much better, but we have not totally eliminated them. We've done blood testing and eliminated anything that showed even moderately reactive. At some point, do we move on from diet and pursue environmental factors? Well, it sounds like he's got a very clean diet now and you're moving further in that direction. So I think that's great. And I would absolutely be looking at environmental factors that might be a cause here. I would also take a look at um, things like uh, just confirm that there isn't a latent sinus infection or allergy response that could be contributing to this. Um, and then really uh, maybe do an allergy panel that looks at things and include mold because mold can be a culprit that can be low level and latent and cause problems like you mentioned. What are your top recommended probiotic products? Great question. Um, I, it depends on what we're trying to do. Um, we use lots of probiotics for different reasons. Um, so basically, fundamentally, for just a good quality support product, we like Claire Labs, their Biotic Complete. We like uh, Kirkman's uh, ProBio Gold and Super ProBio Gold. Um, we like, there are several other um, products that are shelf stable that we've begun using. Um, Garden of Life Primal Defense is a product that's shelf stable that we've used in some children with good results. We also like um, Microbiome Labs um, product, and that's also a shelf stable um, bacteriophage product. Designs for Health makes one that's really good. So in looking at a place to start, that might be after we have basic testing for a client, that might be where we begin, or if a child has um, ongoing uh, issues like diarrhea or constipation, we might draw a lab, we might get laboratory testing completed and then begin one of those basic products and tweak if necessary. And then the tweaks come from the laboratory data that we gather. So we may wanna use something, if something comes back with elevated um, yeast or fungus, we might think that using a, a yeast fighting yeast like Esculardi would be appropriate. We might want to look at some other um, more targeted uh, probiotics and use strains that are specifically for the small bowel, for, like, for example, if we have issues there. Um, we're start, people are starting more and more to differentiate and using oral health probiotics to deal with the oral microbiome. Um, it really depends on um, what we're addressing. VSL number three is a great prescription level product. Um, and uh, that's used for kids who have severe and significant GI issues. And we use that on a rotating basis. So lots and lots of probiotics out there that we like to work with. And um, more and more families are uh, really using that data to drive and make a probiotic plan. Um, I know there's a recent uh, media attention to probiotics being um, not necessarily healthy, and I haven't, um, I've only seen a handful of negative reactions to probiotic usage in the past 20 years. Uh, I mean, I truly can count on one hand of the many, many kids that we've served here who we've had a problem with probiotics, and I certainly don't think we're causing either short-term or long-term damage, and I've seen lots of improvements with their use. And when you're using a brand um, that's highly tested and vetted and trusted and a practitioner that you feel is educated and making recommendations like this, I think that you can feel safe and secure in using this as a basic intervention from a GI perspective for your child. Um, the next question I have is, can I hide supplements in my son's sandwiches? Is this okay? It is the only way he will take them. It depends on which supplements you're take you're um, offering that way. Some supplements are um, uh, are just fine and shelf stable, so they can be um, 
put into a sandwich or any other um, any other food, um, and they would be just fine. Some supplements are heat sensitive, so things like probiotics and some vitamins you can't put into um, anything that's warm, or um, they won't they'll lose their efficacy. Um, so it really depends on what you're talking about burying. Um, I tell families um, there are lots of ways to sneak things in and we can work on those. Sometimes we work with ABA therapists in doing that um, so that uh, everything that um, gets in is still viable um, when it's consumed. So let's see. I recently observed a white hair on my four-year-old son's head. I read that it may be due to nutritional deficiency. He is a child with avoidant and restrictive food intake disorder, which is linked to his autism. He mainly eats breaded fish, pizzas, french fries, bread, biscuits, and yogurts. Generally speaking, I'm worried about the lack of vitamins and fibers in his diet. Should I give him any dietary supplements? Yes. Um, that uh, the white hair that you mentioned has been linked in some research studies to nutrient deficiency, specifically zinc, um, and a broad spectrum vitamin and mineral product would be helpful given his limited diet. Um, so you want to choose a product, perhaps a whole foods product that you can get in, um, and then a multivitamin on top of that. Um, and there are, uh, a number of options out there that I mentioned earlier. And then the, the third thing I would say is consider adding in fermented foods beyond the yogurt as well. So um, kefirs and um, fermented vegetables, anything that will increase the probiotic content of what's going into his GI tract to keep him moving. Um, and try that before you think about adding in a fiber supplement as well. Um, and if you have further questions or follow-on questions from that, I'm happy to discuss that with you um, privately via email. What else do we have here? Um, I have two children with folate cycle deficiencies. Is it important to be grain-free with this type of issue? If so, why? We are already gluten-free and folic acid-free. Um, so. I feel like it's not necessarily important to be grain free. I've read and I've spoken with some practitioners who do feel like that's an appropriate approach. Um, my thought is that um, unless you have overt GI symptoms that contribute to maldigestion and malabsorption that would exacerbate ongoing folate cycle deficiencies, um, then not necessarily. Um, if you have a child who has GI symptoms in conjunction with these concerns that aren't resolving on the gluten-free folic acid approach that you're using, um, then I would say it's of consideration and that would be a natural consideration for us in those in circumstances with any child, honestly, um, who's having uh, GI problems on an ongoing basis despite an elimination diet approach. My daughter was diagnosed almost six years ago with autism and we are currently attempting to do a gluten and casein tree diet. It can be a little difficult but because lunch is at school and we, we're not really doing well knowing the do's and don'ts. Could you please explain if the diet really works, how it works and what not to do? This is a great question, and I'm gonna direct you to the webinars that we have archived on our website and also those that are archived on the Autism Research Institute website at autism.com, because there are several, there are several, at least a handful, if not more, of presentations there that you can um, look at and learn from that give all these details that tell um, the history of the research behind this approach, why we use it sometimes and recommend it, how it works, uh, troubleshooting, problem solving tips, information on how to communicate with the school so that you know exactly what your child needs, how to get a gluten and casein female provided for your child by the school district. All of those things um, are covered in these archived webinars and they can give you so much more information than I have the time to cover here now. 
Um, let's see what else. My daughter has terrible issues with gas and I don't know why. What is your suggestion? Our doctor only prescribed Beno. Okay, so your doctor's prescribed um, a digestive enzyme to assist with this and I don't know if it's working or not. Um, but I would start with, let's think about the flora in your daughter's gut. Something is creating a problem. Um, so it's either an inability to digest, which is what the Beno is supposed to address, or there could be um, there could be a lack of um, a, a balance in that flora that could be driving it, and there could also be uh, an intolerance response to something that she's eating. So all of those could play a role in what you're seeing here with her. M my thought would be if you can work with a practitioner to get. Um, uh, to look at her diet because I don't have information here on what she's eating. Um, my first thought would be look at removing fluid milk if she's drinking fluid milk and think about probiotics. Um, and both of those things I can't say and recommend in isolation because I know there are many other factors out there influencing what's going on. But the two things that I would think about from a clinical perspective, if you were sitting in a consultation across from me would be, okay, let's see how she's responding to fluid milk if she's consuming it, because that's a presentation that we see with other children who've had a problem with it. Um, and then let's look at building healthy flora in her gut. And that would be starting with a probiotic. <clears throat> My question is, I have put my seven-year-old with severity level one on a gluten-free diet, but I could not make it casein-free. I removed cow's milk as he showed sensitivity to some extent on the food IgG test. He did not show sensitivity to goat's milk, so I give him about 120 milliliters of goat's milk and goat's cheese every day. Considering it's prebiotic, I feel it might be doing something good to his body. What is the gain to risk ratio if he continues on goat's milk? His peptide test is high. Okay, so that's a lot of information there. I guess the part that's missing for me is why we can't, why you don't want to or cannot make it a casein free diet. Um, would he be too self limited then? Are you afraid that there won't be appropriate nutrients then? For me, um, and I, uh, I think about this as a risk benefit, just as you mentioned. Um, I would try an elimination diet with the guidance and support of someone who can make sure that any deficiencies are addressed, um, even for a short period of time. What we do know about exposure to and responsiveness to um, the proteins found in um, dairy is that they tend to um, be eliminated from the system quickly and those uh, antigens and antibodies that are produced decline quickly. That's not the case for all things, particularly gluten. It takes much longer for gluten to, and an adverse reaction and response to gluten to clear the system. But with dairy, it's fairly quick. So I often tell families, let's just try it for a weekend. Stop offering this product on Friday and see who's living with you on Monday and really watch and look at that just over a 72 hour period. And often families will say, wow, and that's enough for them to keep going with that. Sometimes families say, we didn't really see anything. We didn't see any change. And so they'll begin to add milk back in. Um, and then that's when a problem occurs. So I would encourage you to make sure that any deficiencies that might be met from a dietary perspective are addressed and then just trial and elimination of the goat's milk as well, um, under guidance, preferably, uh, of a practitioner. But given the circumstances that you mentioned, um, I think that uh, the benefit of at least taking a short-term break from that exposure could give you more data to make a longer-term decision. So I don't see any other questions, I think. Let me take a look through everything I have here in front of me. Um, but I think I've covered just about everything that we've received so far. Um, oh, what do you know about collagen and collagen products and do you recommend them? 
I, um, we recommend lots of support with gut building and tissue building products, um, including bone broths and making homemade bone broths. Um, we also use collagen supplements with some kids, and I find that they're very, very, um, they're, they're meant um, to be supportive of tissues and bone. Um, and they're also very soothing for uh, the gut. And as many of the kids that we work with have this ongoing inflammatory process, uh, uh, it's something that we can use in conjunction with other things to help uh, dampen down this hyper responsiveness in the GI system from an immune perspective, dampen down this ongoing constipation or diarrhea and help that um, and contribute to um, better health. So, all right. I think that that is the last of the questions that I have. If you have other questions that I'm somehow not seeing here, or um, you've thought of while we've talked, I'm happy to answer those via email if you just send them along. Um, I'm happy to get to them um, in the coming days. And thank you so much for participating.